Yan School is Western Canada High, a regular public school in Calgary. But he's not exactly your regular schoolboy. For starters, he has skipped three grades. Lynn Rule is the vice principal. It initially started with a um, principal of his elementary school recognizing he was truly gifted and contacting our school. So it was never a parent push. It was, uh, it's, and it's never been a school. Um, we're not pushing him here. Uh, the parents agreed. There was no need or desire for him to finish his high school by the time he was 13 or 14. He will probably finish when he's 15. Between school, concerts, practicing, studying and traveling, Jan is one busy guy. What do you do for fun? Do you get time for fun? I do. I, I swim. I love to read. I love to... Um, I love to watch movies with my parents as well. Um, love to go for walks. Love flying. <laughs> Next to music, flying is Jan's passion. His bedroom is filled with books about planes. He loves everything about flying, even what most of us hate, such as waiting in airports or being strapped for hours in plane seats. But fame does have its privileges, privileges the average kid can only dream of, like getting a private joyride over San Francisco. A lot of 14-year-olds hang out at malls, they play video games, uh, uh, hang out with friends. Do you get to do these things? Well, I don't really hang out at malls. I actually don't, don't like doing those things, so I, I don't miss much because... Um, I wouldn't enjoy doing it anyways, no matter if I was being a normal kid or, you know, normal kid in quotes or not. Um, I would probably enjoy reading way more than going and hanging out with friends. The seduction can be that the life appears to be so exciting that you get complacent or that he falls into a type of caricature of himself. So I think it's imperative that he has great challenges uh, always and always is pursuing new adventures in his thinking and his way of doing things. It's not like suddenly one day you wake up and think, oh, I'm going to become a pianist, that's my dream. And it's sort of something that evolves maybe over a year, over two years. Um, and it comes, and eventually you notice, you realize that you really love what you're doing. Someone else also loves what Jan's doing. Conductor Boris Brat, who has studied and played Beethoven all his life finds the tone of Jan's playing extraordinary. So how far can the boy go? Well, I've often said that the potential there certainly is there to be a talent in the mold of a Gould. Now, I'm not suggesting that he plays like Gould or that he will be a great Bach interpreter. Uh, I love the way he plays Mozart. I love the way he plays Beethoven. Um, I love the way he plays Chopin. I mean, he has a sense of being able to move from composer to composer and to literally don their cloak, to wear their jacket, as it were. And, and that's, I mean, that is the art of an interpreter, to really become that composer's alter ego as if they were alive today what world do you still have to conquer oh, there's, a there's a lot there's there's a lot there's always even in even in the worlds that I so-called conquered uh, I haven't really 
explored all the possibilities that there are, and there's a lot. You can uh, find different harmonies, different melodies, and you, you can never learn a piece to its fullest. I don't think even the composer knew to the end exactly. I, I don't think the composer knew his piece as well. Sometimes as some pianists that have spent a lot of time working on those pieces. Jan's parents only have one ambition for their son. We want him to stay happy and we would like him to be able to choose in life what he really would like to do in, in, in his life and what would make him happy. And what if a career in music doesn't work out? Well, I, I think I'd be a little bit disappointed, but I would still love the music and I would have the option of becoming a pilot. <laughs> a young man determined one way or another to soar. At 14, he has already soared higher than any plane could ever take him. With his music, he has been able to reach out and touch our hearts and soothe our souls. Magnus Carlsen is the best in the world. He's a 21-year-old Norwegian, reigned supreme in a sport played by 500 million people. It's chess. Many don't think of it as a sport because nobody moves. But chess masters will tell you it can be more brutal than boxing. That's because at the championship level, the objective is not only to win, but to demolish your opponent. That can take hours. The best players need extraordinary endurance, so most of them are young. Magnus is the youngest number one ever. And no one can explain to you how he does what he does. It seems to come from another world, which is why he's become known as the Mozart of chess. Buti Getra. Just look at what he's doing. Buti Löperdetto. Competing against ten players simultaneously. That in itself is not extraordinary, but Magnus cannot see the boards. He's facing the other way. So he has to keep track of the positions of 320 pieces blind. And the number of possible moves, infinite. And Magnus comes out on top. It's the most amazing thing I've ever seen. Do you have any idea how extraordinary this looks to... No, it's uh, one of the amazing things in chess that you can you can you don't really need a board you can just keep but it, it, it transcends chess I mean I just uh, I, I just can't fathom what you've just done it's just no. it seems like it's supernatural last December we caught up with him at the London chess classic he arrives with his constant companion his father Magnus will play against eight other top-ranked players but he is the star as celebrated in this world as Eli Manning is in his. The world number one player from Norway, Magnus Carlsen. Today Magnus is playing America's number one, Hikaru Nakamura. The match will last four hours and there will be no breaks. Magnus will go on a stroll now and then, but his mind won't be going anywhere. He says he's concentrating not only on this game, but on other games played by other masters at other times, which he might want to draw on now. Ten thousand of them. We gave him a test. It was played right here in London, um, Simpsons on the Strand, mm -hmm. in 1859. I don't know the month or day. You got it wrong. Not 59? 51. Wow. You see, your memory isn't... Superb it's, it's, and not everything. What, it's not what it used to be. <laughs> Chess players are pretty poker faced, but occasionally Magnus will flash the smile of someone who knows it's all over but the handshake, while Nakamura dives deeper into doom. Magnus was playing brilliantly, and he knew it. Is there anything in life more satisfying than 
that feeling when you're playing brilliantly? I don't know, but it's, it's really, you know, up there. <laughs> it's pretty good. Yes. The spectators seem as mesmerized as the competitors. They're all chess players, of course. If they weren't, it would be like watching paint dry. Worldwide, a hundred thousand are watching on their computers. The suspense keeps building until endgame, by which time, it's cutthroat. But do you enjoy it when you see your opponent squirm? Yes, I, I do. I, uh... Enjoy it when I see my opponent, you know, really suffering when he knows that I've uh, that I've outsmarted him. If I lose just one game, then usually, you know, I just want to really get revenge. This is war, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. For 50 years, chess was war. It was a battleground in the Cold War with the Russians who were dominant. But then an American came along. His name was Bobby Fischer. In 1972, he took on the Russian champion Boris Spassky, and he won. It was an international spectacle. And the enthusiasm has not waned. What number is this? <laughs> Back in London, just down the corridor from where Magnus is playing, 500 novices are learning how to master kings and queens. Do you ever, um... Play any any grown-ups? Yes. Yep, I do play grown-ups. In fact, I'm getting to the hang of playing grown-ups. Who's your um? Who's your favorite chess player? Bobby Fischer. Bobby Fischer. And no, and no, I like Magnus. Also. You like Magnus? Chess is now routinely taught in schools all over the world, including the United States. In some countries, it's compulsory. Chess can be taught but not genius. Magnus seemed like a normal enough kid growing up outside Oslo. But wait a minute. When he was five, he could name almost all the countries in the world, and their capitals, and their populations. Magnus's father, Henrik, didn't think that was terribly unusual. He did have a good memory and the ability to concentrate for hours at the time uh, on a specific topic, and he seemed to be interested in a lot of things new things all the time, but I thought that was normal. Uh, sure. What got him into chess? Sibling rivalry. His older sister started to play, so he wanted to beat her, which he did, quickly. Then he started winning tournaments. Before long, he became a celebrity, one of the first Norwegians to excel in a sport that did not involve snow. People lined up in shopping malls to play him. When he won, Magnus said it was just a game, no big deal. He couldn't understand why people were making such a fuss. Oh, why does, why does uh, all, all people want to talk with little me, you know? Magnus's parents took him and his sisters out of school for a year, rented out their house, sold their car. It was part holiday, mostly chess. They went to Reykjavik, Iceland, which is where Magnus took a leap into legend, when he was matched against Garry Kasparov, the Russian, considered by many to be the greatest ever. And how did Magnus prepare? By reading up. Kasparov kept the 13-year-old kid waiting for half an hour, and when he did arrive, he didn't even say hello. It was speed chess, the Formula One of the sport, a race against the clock. Kasparov started slow. Magnus started getting bored. I sat there for a few seconds and then I thought to myself, you know what, I don't know why he's thinking, but I know what my response is going to be anyway, so I'll just walk off and watch the other games. Kasparov had never played anyone so young, but he did not exude confidence or happiness, and he did not win. Magnus played him to a draw. It was a sensation. Kasparov left quickly. No nice game, kid. Nothing. How did Magnus react? Guess. He thought he had blown it. When I actually got the winning position, I, I had little time. I was nervous, and I couldn't finish him off. Why were you nervous? I was playing Kasparov. I was <laughs> intimidated. <laughs> you, were, you were intimidated? by playing the world champion when you were already 13 years old? Yeah, go figure. 